think when we talk about business, that it's about the perspective of, you know, what is food and what is acceptable in food, you know, the curved banana doesn't sell. Well, this is also how we market food. And so in all businesses, whether you're a food related business or not, there is a, a portion of education that is often given to employees. And so we can be encouraging knowledge uh, around more sustainable food practices, the impact of food. You know, you, you yourself were, um, you know, shocked at how much the decrease that we've been spending on food. Well, many people don't realize that that's the case. They think that food is actually uh, more and more expensive and that they're spending more and more money on food every, every day. We don't actually realize that the nutritional value of food has is, is been decreasing by half sometimes, depending on the food crops that we're looking at over the last 50 to 70 years. We don't realize that, um, the small holdings farms around our cities are actually, you know, some of the hardest hit when it comes to things like COVID and, and all of these different things. So I think there's a huge educational component, which is why we also focus on education, not only consultation, but also breaking this mindset of the producer consumer, right? This is the, we love dualities as humans. We love uh, black and white. We love good or wrong. We love producer consumer, human versus nature. And all of these constructs often make it a lot easier for us to be oblivious to really what's going on in our food system. And you know, many people say, uh, you're never gonna produce enough food in your apartment to uh, be self-sufficient, so why bother, right? You're not gonna grow enough greens on your balcony to eliminate the grocery store, so what's the point? But if you can produce in the middle of winter batches of, of broccoli sprouts that are incredibly nutritious and that actually keep you healthy um, physically and keep you not uh, getting sick and then actually even more productive in your own work and projects, the impact is, is huge. Um, there's also something that I experience when I work with clients. Uh, I've seen people for the first time pick their very first tomato that they ever grow from seed. And this one case, it was a 70 year old man that we helped set up a balcony garden. And believe you me, he did not produce enough tomatoes to be self-sufficient on his balcony, but that one tomato and the first bite of it, there were tears in his eyes. It was a revolutionary kind of interaction and connection with food that then opens and unravels this whole dichotomy and duality of the producer consumer. So we can't get too far into all that right now, but the, I really think it's about education and it's about providing um, moments of inspiration and, and willingness to test and trial uh, all these different fun things. I mean, right behind me, I produce um, almost half of my annual supply of turmeric, right? Who would have thought you could even do that in Montreal? in uh, indoors, right? So there's all kinds of interesting things that we can bridge and it's not about producing sustainable or, or, or equivalent amounts of food, but it's about cracking and breaking that divide from producer consumer. So first of all, just to kind of break the, the language barrier, permaculture is a fancy word for observing with principles that we, uh, designing with principles that we observe in nature. So ecological design is a much more digestible kind of name to go under. So with ecological design, basically what we're looking at is whenever we address a problem, we look at how nature would solve that problem. And if you look at the earth, you know, a couple uh, millions of years ago, uh, it was actually a big ball of rock. And if you look at the biological processes that turned that rock into this prime arable soil, this is what we want to mimic in permaculture. Now, obviously, we don't have another, you know, 4 million years uh, or 3.6 billion years or whatever of evolution to build that soil again. So what we're looking at is how nature would build the soil and then how can we as humans and with intellect and technology fast track that evolution of the of the natural process. So for example, one of the um, you know, one of the co-founders of the permaculture movement in the beginning was uh, P.A. Yeomans, who actually developed a water management and uh, erosion management system in Tasmania, in Australia. And they were able to document in 18 months, uh, six inches of topsoil being created. Now, this breaks totally that natural, um, you know, if we're going to wait around for nature to regenerate soil, like Carolyn said, we really have no time for that. So it is, you know, it's really up to us as designers and, and practitioners within the soil field to learn these principles of regeneration and apply them at a massive scale. 
Now we talk a lot about regenerative agriculture and this is what the focus of the permaculture presentation will be after this, but we need regenerative lifestyles. We need our parks to be built upon organic matter cycling that is building soil, capturing rainwater, reducing flood and producing food within the city limits. That's not an agricultural site, that's a productive edible forest park. Uh, we need our gardens and our yards to be performing in ways that they are reducing all of these different elements and not just uh, look at soil being produced as an agricultural responsibility, although it is because agriculture is one of the biggest um, biggest leading causes of degradation and loss of soil to erosion. But uh, also, as Carolyn mentioned, in the urban, if we just cover everything in asphalt and concrete, the, the, you, can't, you, know, you can't regenerate the soil that is, is locked under there until you remove that concrete. So biophilic design is actually a design process by which we observe how the patterns of nature are naturally affinitive to humans. We've evolved in nature for thousands of years, millions of years. And so what we do now today is we live 90% of our lives indoors or in a concrete jungle with very few references to nature, visual, uh, auditory, uh, aromatic, or whatnot. So biophilic design, if you look at the examples in Singapore, the, there are areas of the city where you're not sure if you're in a park or if you're in the city. And you would think that you're in the park, but then your office building is right there. And you look out your office building and there's a jungle. And so they're breaking this barrier between green space and gray space and redefining the ultimate um, the ultimate evolution of what urban spaces are. So the, the cities are designed to capture every drop of rainwater that, that lands on that city and recharge the aquifers. Today, only 1% of our water that lands on a city goes back to the aquifer. They are building uh, carbon in all of the soil, in all of the areas. As much of the pavement as possible is permeable pavement. The parks are designed as more wild spaces rather than fully maintained spaces. There are maintained areas, but you know, in integration. So biophilic design is really the urban answer and regenerative agriculture has come to the forefront as the agricultural answer. But again, I don't believe in this duality or dichotomy that soil degradation is going to make it hard to grow food and therefore it's farmers responsibility. This is an everyday way of life and I work with farmers, um, you know, here in the plateau in, or sorry, farmers, urban, urban farmers, urban homesteaders who have backyards and we capture and build soil carbon at dramatic rates while having beautiful peonies and or uh, you know gardens rose gardens and all these different things as well so there's not just the agricultural responsibility but there's also an everyday responsibility in all of our ways of life it's really interesting because i actually was given a uh, uh getting a conference for bbr which is a Le Brun rouge it's a big marketing firm they were talking about how to become future proof as a business and they're hoping for some new you know design process or something like that and what we actually talked to them about was through biophilic design. With the integration, as you can see behind me in my chaotic jungle, um, there are branches of wood, there are patterns of leaves. It's almost hard to, to focus on me, which is part of the reason it's there, but it's, you, you get distracted by these cha chaotic patterns of nature. Well, if we had your brain in an MRI at this moment, we would actually see parts of your brain being stimulated that are identical to if you were walking in the forest. Now, if we had a, a tabletop waterfall in your, your room as well, we have another level of the stimulation of your brain that is the same. And because a, a human being has evolved for millions of years in these natural patterns, those actual patterns cause a natural state of calm. And so we can reduce, and the statistics are, are proven, they're online, they've been researched for many, many years, but in the Human Spaces report, they say 20% reduction in stress, um, which is the leading cause of illness and uh, the leading cause as a business of loss of, of work and productivity. Uh, burnouts is huge. Burnout is a term that everybody knows. I don't even have to explain what it means um, because we're also familiar with this term. Well, if we increase green space, we increase not only just plants in your space, but you know, preserved moss art or, or patterns of nature, we can dramatically increase uh, all of these different benefits. And reducing stress, uh, designing, we can design offices that are using certain patterns of nature to actually create more mystery. And the mystery sparks the creativity of your brain and the, the problem solving, because basically in nature, if you're walking through the woods and you can't see behind the bushes, your brain is hypothesizing all the potential outcomes that are behind that bush. So if you are in a brainstorming productivity session with a team, you don't wanna be in a gray room with white walls that has no 
imagination, that creative part of your brain shuts off. You want a mystery, you want um, shadows and, and corners that are unseen, so it stimulates that part of your brain. Now, you may want a moment of the day where you want to calm down. Well, we can actually take those same patterns and change them around and use different patterns and associations to make spaces of the office that actually calm and relax you and release you from that prepared stress of the unknown. So there are many different patterns of nature that we can integrate into the workplace. And uh, Singapore is really the leading uh, example in, in many ways of biophilic design to a point where there's even uh, food production in offices that's also building wellness.